today to host sorry, to host Dr. Um, Daniel Ababayu, um, who is a postdoc in biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia um, under the mentorship of Tom Barker um, in the Matrix Biology and Engineering Group. Um, so Dr. Ababayu received his PhD in biomedical engineering um, from VCU in 2017, where he was an IMSD fellow um, and worked on molecular immunology and sort of the role of um, uh, biomedical scaffold architecture and degradative byproducts um, in sort of leveraging innate immune responses. Dr. Ababayu received a BS in biomedical engineering from UVA, so he came back um, in 2011. He's won many, many awards um, and that includes an F32 fellowship, a rising star in engineering and health award from um, biomedical engineering at Columbia, an intersection science fellow award from Yale. Um, and he's been an invited speaker, um, not just here, but also in the Vanderbilt Emerging Scholars and Engineering series. So this is, um, this is an exciting seminar series for our center. Um, we're really pleased to highlight some of the, the best and brightest up and coming um, uh, young scientists. And today is no exception. So Dr. Ababayu. Please take it away. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, we can ask them at the end. Although, do you mind if uh, I interrupt you if there's any question that seems essential to ask during the talk? Um, I do not mind do at all. I heard okay, that. very good. All right, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and I'm happy to, to be with you all today and share my work that I've been doing for the last few years with Tom Barker at the University of Virginia. And the title of my work is looking at how immunostromal axes uh, can contribute to pulmonary and biomaterial mediated fibrosis. So uh, today I'm going to walk you through a bit of background and kind of take you to the take you through the two different stories that I'll be looking at both in lung fibrosis and in fibrosis that occurs in response to biomaterials. And then uh, as I am now wrapping up my fourth year in my postdoc, uh, looking forward to my future independent career, I want to try and uh, share with you kind of the vision I have for the future independent work that I want to do uh, as, I, as I look ahead. So the, it's currently been, it's recently been reported that approximately 45% of deaths in the developed world can be attributed to some sort of uh, fibrotic or uh, tissue remodeling disease. And in the Barker lab at UVA, we're, in, we're, we're really interested in trying to understand some of the molecular mechanisms that occur uh, that underlies some of these uh, fibrotic disorders. There's been really extensive work uh, recently that's tried to characterize the immune cell compartment uh, that happens during fibrosis or dysfunctional mechanotransduction, um, or really more so the stromal compartment looking at uh, what prompts myofibroblastic differentiation, what are the cues and ECM changes, but there's been little work looking at the interface between those two. How might the immune cell uh, and their solvent factors be contributing or driving uh, stromal cell uh, stromal cell dysfunction, and that's really the the interface that I, the uh, that interface is where I kind of see myself uh, in my future career and kind of the context for the work that I want to try and show you today. So a little bit of background for the disease of interest that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It is a terminal disease that's characterized by excessive ECM deposition within the interstitial, interstitial spaces between the alveoli and the lung. Uh, that that thicken, that interstitial thickening and uh, fibrosis, what ends up happening is it restricts the ability of alveoli to expand and really inhibits appropriate gas exchange. Uh, there are not very good diagnostic approaches. Uh, currently, radiographic imaging, uh, high resolution radiographic imaging is the current approach, and it only permits late stage diagnosis, which then leads to a median survival rate of about two to three years. And it's also important, uh, as the name implies, that there is no single cause, that there's no cure, and that there are only somewhat successful therapies that slow down the progression of the disease. And so there's a really, as, especially as we have, as this is an age-related disease and as we have an aging population, it's, this is becoming a disease that's really important for us to try and better understand, especially as these patients, more recent work has demonstrated that these patients are more susceptible to severe cases of uh, COVID infection. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, 
with this uh, histological image, what you can appreciate is that to the far left is what uh, normal lung typically looks like. And to the far right are the dense fibrotic regions that are in order of magnitude stiffer. But in that, in, in that uh, intermediate region is where the active sites of fibrosis are occurring, where it's, the stiffness is not too different from normal tissue, but it, they possess these sites that are called fibroblastic foci. And what it's, it's interesting to note that, you know, that uh, our group has recently shown that they're not significantly, uh, they're not significantly uh, more stiff, but they, there has been work demonstrating that they're more viscoelastic. And what we've seen is that these fibroblastic foci have been characterized as being CD90 or thi one negative. Uh, and it's really, it's really important to note that uh, thi one is a, is a molecule that's really of great importance to our lab because it's a GPI anchored protein on the cell membrane. Um, it's Thi1 was first discovered in T cell precursors as, as the name uh, signifies it's thymocyte antigen one or Thi1. And so it's, but it's been identified in a lot of other cell populations, including astrocytes and fibroblasts. And what our lab has shown that in the fibroblast population, Thi1 seems to confer a, a, a mechanosensitive rigidity sensing uh, role and so when you're looking at fibroblasts that have been seeded on soft or stiff polyacrylamide gels, what you can appreciate is that as expected, uh, fibroblasts that are thymol positive will undergo cytoskeletal remodeling in response to a stiffer environment. But the thymol negative fibroblasts seem to have no change in their, uh, in their response to the changes in their stiff, their stiff environment. And if you look below, looking at uh, cortical cell stiffness using AFM, what we can see is that when uh, when we knock down thi one with an shRNA, what we see is that uh, that regardless of a soft versus stiff substrate, their cell, their cortical cell stiffness does not change uh, when thi one is absent, and that the adhesion size, the focal adhesion area, similarly also does not change when thi one has been knocked down, and. In, response, in, in addition uh, to the cytoskeletal remodeling and the focal adhesion size, what we also see is that thi one loss also uh, can alter ECM assembly. Uh, when looking at fibroblasts that have been collected from IPF patients, the thi one positive fibroblasts on a soft substrate uh, don't, don't d d begin to express very little ECM proteins, but as expected on a stiff, stiff substrate, they'll begin to express fibronectin and, and procollagen one. But what's noteworthy is that the thi one negative fibroblasts, regardless whether on, they're on soft or stiff, will begin to express fibronectin and procollagen one, indicating that they're beginning to lay down collagen and remodel their environment. And when we think, when we want to try and know what might thi one be binding to, because it's been shown that uh, thi one has an integrin binding domain, what we see is that if you uh, if you pull down uh, for uh, for th for thi one, what you see is that they also bind to alpha B integrins on the on, on the same uh, on on the same plasma membrane, so they're binding in cis. Uh, and so our lab has kind of developed a bit of a model for uh, thi one, where thi one positive fibroblasts in a soft environment will have thi one binding to alpha B beta three, keeping it in a bent and inactive conformation. But in a stiffer environment, what will end up happening is that they'll permit alpha V beta three to bind and engage fibronectin and uh, subsequently begin to remodel their, uh, their microenvironment. Um, but in a thi one negative fibroblast, in the absence of thi one, alpha V beta three is available and able to bind to their fibronectin, to fibronectin and begin to display uh, display a phenotype that is typically seen on a, a, a stiff environment, on, uh, but this time on a soft one. And the, uh, the activity, this, this role that thi one has on alpha V beta three is important because our, our lab has recently shown that thi the, the, the loss of thi one is, uh, drives the ability of cells to remodel and uh, to strain stiffen their local environment, what we did was we tried to look at within a 20 micron radius around a cell, use the AFM tip to try and look at the stiff, look at the stiffness of the local, of the, uh, the proximal region within 20 micron radius of the cell. 
And what was really interesting is that if you use an alpha beta three neutralizing antibody, what we see is that these cells are no longer able to strain stiffen the local proximal area around the cell. And really importantly is that this loss of phi one uh, promotes a more severe bleomycin induced lung fibrosis. And so what we're able to see is that, uh, what we're able to see is that first, that by day 14, fibrosis occurs and it resolves away by day 42 in the wild type mouse. And in a thigh one knockout mouse, what we see is that it peaks at day 14 and it continues to get worse after day 42, showing that this is a non-resolving fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis model. And what's really important to note is that using an active alpha V beta three antibody, WOW1, you see that, uh, that uh, active alpha V beta, alpha v beta three is present throughout the fibrotic lung. And so again, this, 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 uh, this data kind of lays the foundation of the role of phi one in rigidity sensing and the importance of its uh, regulation of alpha V beta three activity. And so in the IPF disease, we see that the, the active sites of fibrosis are characterized by the absence of phi one, as well as the presence of alpha SMA expression, indicating uh, uh, the, uh, the canonical myofibroblastic marker uh, in, in disease. And it's really important to note that the loss of thigh one is uh, across the lung, these fibroblasts go from being 95% uh, thigh one positive in normal lung to 85%. So there's only a 10% drop uh, in thigh one expression, but it's really localized spatially to these active sites of fibrosis. Uh, yet we don't know what promotes the loss of thigh one. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, pointing to a role for inflammation in IPF disease. There's even been anti-inflammatories that have been used to try and uh, as a potential therapeutic intervention, but hasn't worked yet. We still see and note that uh, inflammation is a critical component in lung fibrosis, even displayed by uh, Thomas Wynn's group, where if you intratracheally, intratracheally deliver IL-1 beta, you can promote a really robust fibrotic response. Um, yeah, there's this, there's a bit of a, a, a large gap between inflammation and the tissue remodeling and dysfunctional mechanical transduction that occurs. And the, the way that we thought that might bridge those two is that a, a hypothesis where inflammatory signaling is promoting the loss of thigh one in lung fibroblasts. And that these, these thigh one negative fibroblasts, even when they're on a soft environment, can potentially uh, begin to remodel and stiffen their environment and into, enter into a more traditional strain, uh, stiffness dependent fibrotic program that will not respond to anti-inflammatory therapies. Um, so to try and answer this question, what we want to try and do is look at pub publicly available RNA-seq data sets to try and figure out what are some of the uh, inflammatory cytokine receptors that human lung fibroblasts express, and then to try and uh, cross-reference that uh, with uh, immunofluorescent staining on IPF tissue samples. And what we were able to see is that in, uh, in IPF patient samples, that IL-1 receptor one uh, uh, overlaid with the fiber proliferative regions that were alpha SMA positive. Um, one thing that we wanna try and do is to try and uh, do a serial section staining to look at both H&E and immunofluorescent staining of IL-1 receptor one and alpha SMA to actually confidently say that these are actually the fibroblastic foci sites that I talked about in the background. But for now, what we're able to see pretty convincing, convincingly is that IL-1 receptor 1 is uniquely uh, overlaying with our alpha SMA positive regions in the IPF. Uh, what we want to try and do next is try and look at uh, knocking out IL-1 receptor 1, as well as thigh 1 to try and see what is happening in the bleomycin-induced fibrosis model in the absence of these two uh, the absence of these two markers. And what we see is that when thigh one is lost, we see that again, that thigh one knockout mice display more severe fibrosis and responsibly in myosin by day 14. But interestingly that the IL-1 receptor one knockout mouse displays very little fibrosis at all in responsibly in myosin. And so this indicates to us that the IL-1 IL receptor one might be, might be playing a critical role in lung fibrosis here. Uh, we wanted to try and understand who, the, which cell population is responsible for secreting IL-1 beta, the ligand for IL-1 receptor one. 
This is, this is a bit of a challenge because typically cells that express IL-1 beta are undergoing cell death. And it's, so it's not as simple as just uh, doing a, a flow sort to figure out which cells are intracellularly expressing uh, IL-1 beta. And qPCR is kind, of, uh, is kind of off the table well, as well because IL-1 beta is uh, made at the protein level and then stored intracellularly in its precursor pro-IL-1 beta form uh, as displayed up top to the left. And what's really required to secrete mature cleaved IL-1 beta is inflammasome activation. And so our plan was to try and look at inflammasome activation as a surrogate for identifying which cells are secreting mature IL-1 beta. We did this using a reporter mouse where uh, the, fluorescent mark, uh, the, flu the fluorescent reporter M-citrine is tagged to ASC, which is a, uh, a protein that's part of the inflammasome. And what's really unique is that uh, we're able to use imaging flow cytometry where we're able to take a picture of each cell that comes through, uh, through the flow cytometer. And what we're able to see, as you can tell in part B, that when there's no inflammasome activation, um, M-citrine is kind of diffused throughout the cell. But when there is inflammasome activation, it creates this speck uh, in the cell. And so what we wanted to try and figure out was in this, blio, using the bleomycin induced fibrosis model, which cells are spec positive. And so what we were able to see, uh, <laughs> uh, what we we're able to see is that, uh, that it's when looking at, uh, the epithelial cell, endothelial cell, and, uh, immune cell markers for CD31, EPCAM, and CD45, we see that the CD45 immune cell population is our primary spec positive population. And when you take, when you look further down to try and look at which among the immune cell populations, which one are primarily our spec positive cells, we see that it's the CD11B and CD11C positive population. Uh, the, the lung is a bit, lung immunology is a bit unique because outside the lung, we can confidently say that CD11B is a macrophage and CD11C is a dendritic cell. Uh, the uh, uh, lung immunology is a little bit more messier where there's kind of uh, cross expression between CD11B and CD11C across macrophages and dendritic cells. So at least what we can confidently say here that it's the myeloid compartment during lung fibrosis that is uh, undergoing inflammasome activation and responsible for the release of IL mature IL-1 beta. And we next wanted to try and figure out what when when fibroblasts are seeing island beta, what's happening? And so what we're able to see is that uh, all of these cells were uh, seated on fibronectin coated polyacrylamide hydrogels that are two kilopascals in stiffness. So these are cells, these are mouse lung fibroblasts that never saw tissue culture plastic, uh, which is important to note. And so what we're able to see is that in response to island beta, thi one expression goes down and that active alpha V beta three goes up. And so, this is really this is really important because it kind of confirms that uh, what is promoting the loss of thi one as well as the what uh, what is the consequence of that thi one loss. And when we gate on our thi when we gate on thi one, was really interesting to see is as expected, the thi one negative cells displayed far more active alpha v beta three, and interestingly, that thi one negative cells expressed far more il one or sub one, indicating that these cells are uniquely poised to respond to il one beta and potentially might, might potentially could serve as a, uh, as a bridge between in inflammatory signaling cues and dysfunctional mechanotransduction that happens during fibrosis. And so what we, wanted to try and, uh, what we wanted to try and understand next was if we remove IL-1 signaling from among uh, Thi-1, uh, I'm trying to pick the say this carefully, if we remove IL-1 uh, IL signaling from a thi one deficient environment, how does that alter lung fibrosis? And so we went back to the bleomycin induced fibrosis model and we wanted to leverage the non-resolving uh, phenotype that we see in thi one knockout, uh, knockout mice. And again, uh, as I shared earlier that wild top mice and response to bleomycin uh, demonstrate fibrosis by day 14, it resolves by day 42 and the thi one knockout mouse displays non-resolving fibrosis. So if we, cross these mice with an IL-1 receptor knockout mouse to create a double knockout, how will the loss of, how will the loss of IL-1 signaling change this non-resolving, more severe fibrotic phenotype? And what we're able to see is that the loss of IL-1 signaling seemed to ameliorate 
uh, or mitigate uh, some of the fibrosis. And you know, it's it's hard to say if we've uh, we're still doing this analysis. It's hard to say if we've uh, made it non-resolving. But what we can say is that we've made this fibrosis far less severe. And so, altogether, we, we we've we've demonstrated that IL one receptor one is present within the fibroproliferative regions in IPF. That uh, the loss of IL one receptor one promotes uh, a, a, a very reduced fibro fibrotic behavior or fibrotic response uh, during the bleomycin model. And that myeloid-derived IL-1 signaling is what's driving this fibrosis. And that uh, this IL-1 signaling at the, fibro at the fibroblast level is promoting the loss of Phi-1 and promoting alpha V beta-3 integrin activity. And that when we remove IL-1 signaling from a Phi-1 deficient uh, environment, that that also ameliorates fibrosis. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm now going to try and pivot towards our biomaterial work to look at uh, phi one in biomaterial mediated fibrosis. So I'm just going to take a quick sip of water. Forgive me. Um, to try and look at the role of phi one in biomaterial mediated fibrosis, we want to try and look at kind of uh, the the polar opposites of biomaterial outcomes. We wanted to look at a more regenerative biomaterial as well as a, a, a really fibrotic biomaterial and. Uh, much, much to our luck, there's uh, uh, Don Griffin's group at UVA has developed uh, during his PhD and postdoc work with Tatiana Segura, who's now at Duke. Uh, they developed this micro porcineal particle system. Um, they, what they were able to do is that using uh, using peg hydrogels, they were able to develop these microgels that are when they anneal together can create this uh, really porous network that promotes great tissue integration and great uh, angiogenesis and very little infl inflammation or fibrosis. And if you take a nanoporous peg hydrogel, same chemistry as, the, as their MAP gel system and subcutaneously implant the two of them, what we see is that the nanoporous gel has a really robust fibrotic response, as you can see in the HD image above. And the wild type, uh, and, and in a wild, these are all in the wild type mice, uh, and uh, the MAP hydrogel, when, it, when it implanted subcutaneously, has very little fibrotic response. Um, what we want to know is if you implant these in thi one knockout mice, what happens? And what was really fascinating was that in a thi one knockout mouse, uh, that the MAP gel had displayed a fibro had, displayed, uh, had a fibrous capsule around it that was remarkably similar to what we saw with the nanoporous gel. Uh, we calculated this, uh, we measured the capsule thickness. It wasn't the same as the wild type mouse, which was a little disheartening at first, but what the conclusion we came to is that the, uh, that in the thought, the thigh one knockout, that there was no difference between the nanopores and the map gel, it further corroborating the theory that thigh one knockout fibroblasts are, uh, mechanically agnostic, that despite, um, that despite the environment that they're in or despite the, uh, with what they're interacting with, they typically seem to behave the same way. And what was also interesting was that across all, uh, across all of our fibrotic implants here, we saw formed by a giant cell formation that, so that was absent with the MAP gel, but very, pre very noteworthy uh, within the fibrous capsule across all of our fibrotic implants here, including especially the final knockout mice. Um, we want to try and characterize a little bit more of what's happening at, within this fibrous capsule. And what we're able to see is that alpha SMA expression is present uh, as expected with the nanoporous, absent with a MAP gel. But regardless of which gel it is in the thyroid knockout mouse, both nanoporous and MAP gels seem to display really robust alpha SMA expression within the fibrous capsule. Um, it, it was really hard to try and it was really hard to try and measure or detect thigh one. Uh, you know, for us, I think it was a matter of uh, uh, a matter of the antibody not working here. But what was really interesting for us here was that when looking at fossil P65 NF kappa B signaling, it was present within the nanoporous gel, absent in the MAP gel, but then really robust within the thi one knockout mouse for both the nanoporous gel and the MAP gel. Um, uh, I, I showed earlier that uh, IL thi one not thi one uh, thi one deficient fibroblast display higher IL-1 receptor 1 expression, potentially indicating they're unique, uh, they're uniquely poised to respond to inflammatory cues. And here, we're seeing that in the thi one knockout mouse, that even the regenerative MAP gel seems to demonstrate really robust 
NF kappa B signaling in the fibrotic capsule. And so again, this seems to indicate that maybe these cells are poised to respond to inflammatory cues, be and uh, be uniquely immunoresponsive and drive inflammation that's non-resolving and uh, potentially promote fibrosis. And so we want to take a little bit closer look at what these inflammatory cues might be doing to these fibroblasts that we're seeing around the gels. And so what we're able to see is that when we take these fibroblasts, seed them on a two kilopascal polyacrylamide gel that's coated with fibronectin and treat with I1 beta or TNF, what we're able to see is that uh, their, their contractility, that their cell area goes up indicating a cytoskeletal remodeling that indicates a higher contractility in these cells. But what's interesting is that for us, we did not see a difference in focal, focal adhesion size based on the banklin staining. Uh, the conclusion we, draw, we drew from that is that these cells are not changing their cell area based on a perceived, uh, perceived ba based on any perceived changes on their substrate uh, at the focal adhesion, but rather there's something, there is a, uh, a biochemical signal. There's a, there's a downstream signaling cascade that, respond, that is responding to IL and beta and TNF that's driving this contractility. Uh, we next want to try and look at how might I1 beta and TNF be driving alpha SMA expression in, fi in fibroblasts. And we saw that uh, using flow that I1 beta and TNF promoted higher alpha SMA expression. But interestingly, if you gate on thigh one, what was really fascinating is that thigh one positive fibroblasts express very little uh, alpha SMA, but rather it's the thigh one negative compartment. The thigh one negative fibroblasts are the chiefly alpha SMA expressing cells. And that that expression goes up in response to IL-1 beta and TNF treatment. Um, we, we next wanted to try and understand if the loss of Thi-1 in response to inflammatory cytokines is recoverable. Um, that if you take them out of cytokines, if you take them out of the presence of these inflammatory cytokines, can they recover Thi-1? And furthermore, we want to try and understand, is this loss of Thi-1 stochastic? Is it always going to be approximately 15 to 20%, or if we purify the thi one negative fibroblasts and continue to expose them to cytokines, is it deterministic? Um, the way we, we went about trying to answer these questions was by treating uh, fibroblasts with uh, IL-1 beta and TNF, uh, sort, and then out to day three, and then sorting them based on thi one expression. And so then we'll have... Uh, Thi-1 positive fibroblasts that are reseeded on hydrogels that will then either see cytokines again or no cytokines. And similarly, Thi-1 negative fibroblasts will be reseeded on hydrogels and either see cytokines again or no cytokines. And then take that out to day five, collect and look at Thi-1 expression. And what we're able to see is that in Thi-1 positive fibroblasts that in their original treatment only saw media, when you treat them with uh, when you put them back in media or uh, put them in, in this case, the cytokine hero is IL-1 beta, uh, we see no change in thi one expressions, demonstrating that these cells are resistant to cytokine-induced thi one loss. Uh, interestingly, in cells that saw media alone at first, uh, that were sorted, uh, that were thi one negative sorted, if you put them back in media, they do not recover thi one expression. Uh, and the, th and the, when they are, in the tr uh, presence of IL-1 beta, uh, that doesn't further uh, promote the loss of thi one, but rather they, they stay they stay thi one negative, indicating that there might be some cells that are predisposed to lose thi one and some cells that are uh, that are that are going to lose thi one and they or they are thi one negative and they stay that way. Um, in cells that their original treatment is IL-1 beta or thi one positive, we sorted them out, we put them back in media. They stayed that way. We put them back in IL-1 beta. They were resistant to, to a secondary dose of IL-1 beta. And those that were thi one negative uh, in response to IL-1 beta, uh, they, they stayed that way. They didn't recover thi one expression when they put, were put back in media alone, and they didn't further lose uh, thi one So there's, uh, and in response to TNF, we saw, again, the, the same behavior. We saw that the thi one positive cells when they were put back in media did not lose, did not regain, or uh, forgive me, these are thi one positive. Uh, cells are thi one positive. When they saw TNF again, they did not lose thi one. And those that were sort to be thi one negative did not recover thi one when they were put back in media alone. And so 
the the takeaway here is that there seems to be a, a bit of heterogeneity within the system where there are some cells that are predisposed to lose style one and some cells that are poised to lose it and some that already have and stay that way and don't recover. Um, so this heterogeneity within the system wanted us to use, led us to want to use single cell RNA-seq to try and define the subpopulations that are present and how those subpopulations might change in response to cytokine treatment, inflammatory cytokine treatment. So what we did was we, Took, uh, we, we took fibroblasts, seeded on polyacrylamide gels, treated with alum beta TNF for three days, and you, uh, took them for single cell RNA seq. And what we're able to see is that in media alone, that there was five subpopulations that emerged. And this was for us, uh, we, were, we, were, we were happy to see that because there's been a lot of work in the last three years now that have identified approximately four to five subpopulations among fibroblasts. And in response to IL-1 beta and TNF treatment, we're able to see that two subpopulations emerged that were not there before, subpopulations two and five. And it's also important to note that population zero also expanded in the inflammatory cytokine uh, treatment group. And what we're able to see is that when looking at the top markers for each subpopulation, there's a, it's really, it's really interesting to note that there's a bit of a, almost a bit of a phenotype behind some of the top markers that we see where for subpopulation three, that there are uh, their top markers that that can, that emerged were all collagen. That for subpopulation one, that there were a mixture of uh, ECM and uh, proteases that were among their top markers. But what was really noteworthy to us was that in subpopulations five and five, two, and zero, uh, those that emerged, that those were primarily characterized by either inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, or receptors. And when doing a gerontology pathway analysis, what we're able to see, what was really fascinating to us is that primarily subpopulations two and five, those that emerge that weren't there originally, are defined uh, by inflammatory pathways that are present either in various diseases or in various, um, uh, or in various, uh, biological pathways. Uh, and so this seemed to indicate to us that there, that those, that the fibroblasts that emerge in response to cytokines might be uniquely poised uh, to be an immunoresponsive or an immunofibroblast subpopulation. And what was really interesting, that kind of goes back to the work that I've been reporting is that these same subpopulations, subpopulations two and five, and the zero population that expanded are all thigh one low. This is at the transcript level, but again, this, this kind of further connects um, inflammation, thigh one, and um, and fibrosis, and so uh, we we wanted to, based on the IL one receptor one expression that we saw in the single cell RNA seq work, we wanted to go back and look at IL one receptor one expression in our hydrogel experiments in vivo, and it was really interesting to see that uh, that the nanopore gel seemed to uh, seemed to display IL one receptor one expression within the fibrotic capsule which was absent in the MAP gel, but in the thigh one knockout mouse uh, that received both the nanopores and the MAP gel, we see really robust IL-1 receptor one expression, um, further corroborating that perhaps uh, there's a, a purification of thigh one knockout cells that are IL-1 receptor one positive and seem to be really important in this bond material mediated fibrosis. Um, and so with that, uh, I will, I'd be happy to try and take some time to to talk to you about some of the future independent work that uh, I hope to do as I look forward. Um, as I described earlier, there's a, there's a great need, I think, to try and study the interface between inflammation and immune cells with uh, tissue remodeling fibroblasts. And based on my background, doing my PhD in a molecular immunology lab, working with Thomas Barker, who's a great uh, fibroblast biologist who's really interested in studying fibrosis, I think, uh, I think I've been really, uh, I've been really fortunate to develop a lot of great training that I think uniquely equips me, I think, to answer some of these questions. Uh, for my future, uh, the name that I have so far for my future lab in my head is the Immunostromal Engineering Lab. Um, the future work I see for this group is, uh, I, I envision as three legs to a stool. Um, there's gonna be a, uh, biomaterial mediated fibrosis uh, arm, a lung fibrosis arm, and a more of a, a basic science big question uh, arm. And so 
this first slide is to try and look at some of the ba more basic science, more basic fundamental questions of fibroblast biology work. Um, and wanting to try and characterize uh, fibroblast heterogeneity um, and their subsequent phenotype, more specifically with mechanical transduction, and look at that in response to inflammation and how specific subpopulations really might be poised to have specific uh, sp specific phenotypes. Uh, there's been a lot of work in immunology that has defined subsets of T cells, subsets of macrophages, uh, dendritic cells that have unique and non-overlapping functions. And I think that same heterogeneity might exist among fibroblasts because there's a lot of phenotypes that we attribute to fibroblasts, but perhaps there might be, there might be uh, specific subpopulations that are tasked with those uh, with those phenotypes that we kind of generally attribute to fibroblasts. And so I really want to try and incorporate single cell RNA seq uh, in my future work to try and better characterize, uh, better characterize uh, fibroblast heterogeneity, how it's regulated, and potentially, um, you know, there's no, there's not a great pan fibroblast marker right now. I think, you know, a lot of other cell populations, whether it's endothelial cells, different kinds of epithelial cells, different kinds of immune cells have really reliable promoters that they can target. Um, for you know cell specific uh, knockout, but fibroblasts don't. Uh, and so my hope is that maybe uh, I can contribute to potentially identifying a really reliable marker uh, that we can use to target fibroblasts specifically. Um, I want to try and look, uh, the second arm of my group will be trying to look at the immunostromal axis in lung fibrosis. Um, one of the key things that I want to try and do is to try and uh, appreciate the uh, what's happening in the fibroblastic foci. Uh, so my hope is to try and do uh, laser capture microdissection work uh, and pairing that with either mass spec or there's a unique tool available at UVA called STOMP. It's spatially targeted optical mi microproteomics. Um, what's, what's really funny is that I think uh, a week ago, uh, Martin Schwartz's group just published an LCM uh, laser capture microdissection with the mass spec in the foci. Uh, and so my hope is, uh, you know, to try and use what they've done already with that and maybe try and uh, pair that with spatial, spatial transcriptomics to try and resolve the spatial heterogeneity and the cellular, heter cellular heterogeneity within um, IPF and try and see if the work that they've done already and how that might uh, speak to or inform the cellular heterogeneity within specific zones or sites in the fibrotic lung. Um, and to really try and find a way to pull out cells uh, from the fibroblastic foci to look at for single cell RNA seq, this has been one of the this is a, a big remaining question uh, in the lung fibrosis field. Trying to figure out how can we define the subpopulations that are ple present within the foci. Um, there's been great work identifying the cells around the foci, uh, cells adjacent to the foci, um, and the cells that are present within dense fibrotic regions. But it's really these active sites of fibrosis that have yet to be characterized and uh, there's still a lot of work there. And I think uh, that's an exciting question that I, that I hope to try and answer. And finally, to use the bleomycin-induced fibrosis model uh, um, with uh, the, right now a, a currently acceptable way of targeting fibroblasts using the PDGFR alpha Cree, and specifically knocking out uh, cytokine receptors and trying to see if these specific signaling axes and fibroblasts, if we can target them, how might that uh, improve fibrotic outcomes, as well as potentially purifying subpopulations and intratracheally adoptively transferring them and seeing if that can make fibrosis worse or make it better. Finally, um, for my uh, biomaterial media fibrosis work, uh, the hope is uh, to try and whether I can continue to use MAP gels and nanopore gels, or rather uh, wherever I end up to try and leverage uh, really uh, disparate uh, biomaterials that are one's fibrotic and one's regenerative, and to try and use single cell RNA seq to try and define what are the cells that are present within a fibrotic versus regenerative biomaterial, both among immune cells and fibroblasts, and using some of the really emerging uh, great techniques to define what are some of the interactions, whether it's um, paracrine or even autocrine, but define some of the interactions that are happening across these cell populations that might define, might uh, identify. Um, really unique targets that we can use to uh, that might improve biomaterial design. Um, you know, I, I've always been in the biomaterial field and I've always loved it. I'm not 
my, my hope is not to necessarily make some sort of new bond material, but rather find ways using this information to improve existing bond materials. Um, and so with that, uh, I want to thank you all for giving me your time. Uh, I want to thank the great group of people that I work with in Barker Lab, our great collaborators, both at UVA and at other universities that are, especially our clinical collaborators. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge my funding sources. And again, I want to thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very, very much. That was, uh, that was, that was actually, that was fascinating. Um, there is a question in the chat, but I just want to ask a question on my own first. And that's just going right back to the beginning where you mentioned previous work from your group that suggested that there, that showed that the foci um, quite surprisingly um, don't have increased stiffness, but do have increased viscoelasticity. And you suggested that the thigh one negative cells there were sort of mechanoagnostic. Um, and I wonder if you can put that together. Yeah, so um, the that uh, ag agnostic, not to anthropomorphize my own negative cells, but I feel like I've been with them so much, like I kind of do that. Um, yeah, the uh, the phenotype that we've characterized uh, with these my one negative fibroblasts uh, has only been done in um, linearly elastic environments, and the uh, and the more recent work uh, indicated that. These uh, these foci are not are non linearly elastic, as well as uh, they it, the, the I think the data seemed to indicate or hint that it was viscoelastic, but I think there's still uh, work needed to to better characterize that. Um, but I you know I think uh, you know this is I think this is a great criticism of uh, I think a lot of the work that some fibroblast biologists do, where uh, we oftentimes say we want to put our fibroblasts in a more physiologically relevant environment. So we put them on these linear, linearly elastic hydrogels that have uh, a single protein that's coated on them. And so, uh, you know, I, I think there, what this indicates to me is that I think that there's potentially more, more work to be done in characterizing thigh one negative cells, particularly in the viscoelastic environment, um, or even as a, as a yeah, I'll, 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 I'll finish that there. And I think there's, there's some, I think there's some people that are trying to create, they're trying to get at that, that answer in general, but not specifically with thyroid negative cells. But I think uh, that, I, I think that's one great work. That's one great experiment that I think needs to be done. Great. That makes sense. Um, Joel Burkle had a question in the chat. Joel, do you want to just Becky, ask yeah, it? Yeah, I can, I can ask it. So Dan, that was really, really great. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm really excited about your work and, and the, the things that you're planning. I, I guess I, first I wanted to encourage you that the, the fact that you're working on things and the, the ideas that you're proposing are things that other people are excited about is a really important thing, right? So don't, don't feel discouraged that other people are, are chasing the same kinds of questions. So that's, that's a good sign, right? I appreciate um, that. Yeah, um, and then the the question I had was, you know, I was really interested in this experiment you did with the sort of history of cytokine um, presentation and um, the data that you showed on thigh one regulating mechanosensing makes me think of like a, a mechanical memory, right? If the, if the cells yeah. are responsive, if, if the history matters and you have a thing that's regulating the cytoskeletal response, um, is this is this response to the these cytokines a, a function of the mechanobiology, or is it is it simply sort of heterogeneity of of these cell populations? No, you know that's a great question. We, you know, I, whenever I whenever I hear mechanical memory, one of the first things I always think of is Boris Hins and his uh, work with uh, microRNA microRNA twenty one as kind of a uh, as kind of like the lever for mechanical memory, at least in fibroblast biology, and so. One of the things that we have yet to answer that we're really interested in trying to answer, and we're collaborating with him now to try to figure out how is uh, thigh one expression related or perhaps regulated uh, by marker RNA twenty one? Um, because I think you know uh, that that study that that study that you uh, the experiment that you pointed to, you know, that's one that we seem to we we keep wanting to say mechanical memory, but you know we haven't done the work to really uh, to uh, explicitly say that, but. You know, I think I, I think it's such a fascinating, it's such a great concept because I think, you know, we so often just grow out our fibroblasts on tissue culture plastic and then put them on hydrogels or in some other environment and say like, okay, like now they're 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 poised and ready to go. But um, you know, I think perhaps there might be 
different, uh, there might be beyond microRNA 21, perhaps uh, if thi one is a part of that mechanical memory, one of the things that we've been really fascinated with is trying to figure out, can we provide soluble thi one as a way to recover that memory or to, uh, as a way to perhaps erase that memory, sorry. Um, and there was work that Jim Hagen's group did where they delivered soluble thi one intratracheally to mice who received bleomycin. And that, uh, interestingly, uh, to my knowledge, it's one of the first studies that have, has, has tried to do this, but a way to like reverse fibrosis. And they were able to with the soluble thi one intratracheally delivered. And so one of the questions that we've been thinking about is how can perhaps soluble thi one be a way to uh, play with mechanical memory? Yeah, great, thanks. And Charlie Anderson had a question. Yeah, thank you guys to hear more about the hydrogels that you used, um, whether they were nanos based or, or the microporous annealed hydrogels. Um, the bead size and spacing of the pores and the size of the pores is of interest to me uh, because doing a project to grow plants through similar materials. Yeah, um, so the microporous annealed particle system uh, the pore size, I want to say is approximately, I want to say it's 30 microns. I remember when we, when we chat about this, we kind of cited Buddy Ratner's work and kind of seemed to say like this kind of, this is kind of fits under the umbrella of the body of work that he's, uh, that he's done. And the, I, when I say, and when I say the nanoporous hydrogels, it's, you know, it's really just a, a bulk, a bulk peg hydrogel system that I typically, I, I first wanted to try and characterize as non-porous, but uh, seemed more apt or more accurate to try and describe them as nanoporous. And so there's, you know, it, it's not a, there's no, there was no unique approach to try and create some sort of nanoporous system, but rather just trying to appreciate the fact that in, uh, in the polymerization of peg hydrogels, that there's like a, a, a nanoscale level of pore size there present, but, you know, it's not, is not going to, that's not going to try and promote any sort of changes in uh, cell phenotype, but rather that trying to increase pore size with the micropore annealed particle system, that those have a great inter interconnected pore system that is on scale of, I think approximately 30 to 40 microns that permits tissue integration and cell in growth. Great, thank you. Other questions? Um, you can just direct, unmute yourself or put it in the chat. But I actually wanted to ask another question myself. Um, so, you know, you have these two new populations, I guess population two and five, and then an expansion of population zero. But thinking specifically about two and five, are they arising from one of the other populations there that you've been able to identify? Or I, I guess my question is, are, is there just a population of thi one negative cells present that um, that begin to proliferate in the setting you know settings you're talking about, or is there actually a phenotypic conversion of another cell type? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we I'm doing the trajectory analysis now to try and look at uh, where these cells are emerging from. Um, you know, typically when we think about myofibroblasts, we think of them as being resistant to apoptosis more proliferative. And uh, I didn't show this work here. We, we have some work that indicates that there's a modest increase in proliferation, um, but not as, uh, not as dramatic as we'd hoped. Uh, but the, these cells, yeah, so uh, there is a modest increase in proliferation and we're doing the trajectory analysis to try and define where these cells are emerging from. Cause I think that, I think that's an important question. It, it'll help us identify potentially which subpopulations we can try and target to try mm -hmm. and alter an effect, maybe their, uh, uh, their transcriptional level change to this by one negative uh, subpopulation. Yeah, it's just, there's so many different groups have published on identity of the different kinds of subtypes of lung fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. You know, people at Penn talk about fat versus alpha SMA, but there's clearly multiple different ways of, um, you know, sort of skidding that cat basically. And I'm just wondering, you know, if sort of how to fit it all together, basically. No, that's a good question. Cause you know, I, uh, you know, I, I just attended my first Gordon conference uh, last, last month. And, you know, there's, 
uh, every talk has single cell RNA seq, and every talk tries to, at least for the fibroblast ones, tries to define their own uh, pathological fibroblast subpopulation by different markers. And I think, uh, I you know, I I I think there's a lot of, I think it's great that there's a lot of work being done to define this heterogeneity. Um, you know, I think, and it's I think fibroblasts in particular are uh, burdened by there's a lack of consensus on a lot of different things, unfortunately, and so. Uh, I think at least within the lung, I think potentially there there is a great opportunity, I think, for identifying a unique subpopulation that is targetable to potentially reverse fibrosis. But it, it feels like there's a lot of work ahead, um, but in a good way. Okay. Yeah, so I have a related uh, question. So uh, the way you sketch the five subpopulations in one of the slides, mm -hmm. Uh, it seems that two of them were, uh, three of them were spindle shaped uh, with some minor differences and two of them were more, more round with a bunch of uh, protrusions. So that would suggest, I, mean, I don't know what the basis for, the, for that sketch is, but it would suggest that at a cytoskeletal level, you know, cell spreading, polarization, et cetera, are different between these subpopulations, right? It is, it is the very first slide in your, I think, uh, future research. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. I'll, I'll go back to that real quickly. Yeah, the different subpopulations. I mean, I, I mean that was a cartoon, but, uh, but it suggests that three and four, from a morphological point of view, look similar. And I would say one, two, and five, uh, more spindle-shaped and polarized. Yeah, no, so, I, you know, this is, yeah, as you pointed out, this is just an animation, but... but uh, but in, but the the spirit of it is trying trying to indicate that I think that there are perhaps different subpopulations that are maybe not currently demonstrating these differences in morphology, but perhaps poised to uh, undergo these cytoskeletal cytoskeletal changes uh, based on their different sub, based on the different subpopulations and transcriptional signature that that uh, predisposes them. I think to uh, to display this way. I think, you know, the, the thyroid negative fibroblast seems to, seems to demonstrate that, but I think to try and take a step back and think beyond just thy one. So like for me in the, in the Barker lab, thy one has kind of been like our world for so long, but to try and take a step back and look further, how might there be other subpopulations that exist that either don't demonstrate that phenotype or that do, and how might inflammation be regulating that? So, uh, so among the five populations, what is the relative abundance of each one? Yes, uh, I think I have that. Do I include that? Uh, uh, I thought I included that here. Forgive me. Uh, so, for subpopulations uh, z zero, let's see, subpopulations one through three constitute primarily about 60% of the subpopulations and subpopulations four through five uh, kind of split uh, split the remainder. Mm. And what, hen what ends up happening is that in response to the cytokine treatment, subpopulation zero expands uh, from perhaps uh, three to 9%. Um, and, but what's unique is that subpopulations two and five go from not being present at all to really the constituting uh, perhaps a third of mm. uh, the fibroblast subpopulation numbers. Forgive me, I, uh, I, I had just created that graphic that demonstrates the proportion of the subpopulations and I realized I didn't include that here, forgive me. Uh, no problem, I have one other question on Taiwan, but I, I guess we are meeting separately so I can ask it, uh, you know, if uh, we're out of time, I can talk to you separately. Uh, no worries, we still have a few minutes. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, so, uh, can you go to the I'm, I'm not the moderator though, so that's Dr. Wells. To... No, that's fine. We have a few minutes, and um, uh, yeah. so I'm sure we all have plenty of questions first, to ask. Uh, it, and if you go to the very beginning, you're explaining how Taiwan is a mechano sensor. Uh, so, I was wondering uh, is, it, is Taiwan part of the focal adhesion complex, or I didn't quite understand how it was uh, uh, playing a role in the adhesion. So if you can explain that a bit more, that'll be helpful. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So it's, 
the, as we understand it now, Phi One is not part of the public education complex, but rather um, permits the uh, uh, regulates the binding of Alpha V Beta Three uh, to uh, to be, to become extended and a part of the focal adhesion complex. And so it's uh, it's not actively part of the focal adhesion, but rather helping to inform what integrins are participating. Um, cause per, at least particularly with fibronectin, um, uh, our, our, our group has previously shown that alpha, and I think this is also work that Daniel, Daniel Mueller has shown that, uh, alpha five beta one and alpha V beta three on, in fibroblasts want to bind to fibronectin. Uh, and typically what will happen is, uh, alpha five beta one will, has a, a bit of a higher, I think it has a higher affinity than v, alpha V beta three. But what ends up happening is that in a stiff environment, thi one kind of permits the uh, permits the engagement of alpha V beta three with fibronectin, and that engagement has downstream uh, outside in consequences of increasing contractility. And I think that there's also work that's demonstrated that it promotes MRTF nuclear translocation and um, kind of the classical indicators of myofibroblastic differentiation. Uh, so, so if I, uh, and I'm not sure it's the right thing to do, but if you sort of classify the adhesions as nascent, focal, and maybe fibrillar, so, mm -hmm. so Taiwan will play a bigger role in the focal and fibrillar and no role in nascent, which, you know, is that, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to mechanistically understand what. Yeah, so I, I, I think you just, I think you, you put it well, that's, that, that's, that's how I've understood it. Okay. All, all right. Yeah, we can talk more. Yeah. Sure. It's just about noon. So I want to thank um, Dr. Abba Bayou again um, for a, a really fascinating talk. I'd actually heard a talk on uh, IPF from a completely different perspective last week. So this is actually very cool. Um, uh, and I know you have meetings scheduled with, um, with a number of people on the call. Um, uh, uh, going, going forward. So, um, thank you again. And, um, if anyone else has any questions, you can feel free to reach out to Dr. Abdullah. Um, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you everyone for giving me your time.